Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Avery Sports Show. My next guest, someone I want to have on for a very long time. She's a trailblazer. She is funny. She is one of the best personalities on TSN. She is a sports center anchor. She is one of the hosts of Sports AM on Quibi. She won the 2019 by Blacks.com. It is my pleasure to welcome onto the podcast, Kayla Gray. Kayla, how are you doing today? Hi, thanks so I know, right? It's been a long time coming. So good to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, the one thing you learn about me is that when I want a guest on, I will hustle. I will message. Oh, you I will don't email. Stop. <laughs> no, I'll find a way to get you on my show somehow. That's the grind right there. You know that grind. That is the grind that I can't you can't knock the hustle. So here I am. Here I am. Of course, of course. I gotta ask you though, first, even before getting into sports and your career, right now I know in Toronto, I know it is what, thirty three, thirty four degrees. How are you how are you enjoying heat right now? Uh, you know, it's a tough time, you know, it's a heat wave, but in Toronto, everything is cancelled. So how are you handling that right now, Kayla? <laughs> <laughs> I got no caravana to look forward to, but uh, everything's going good. Honestly, the weather's been nice. Today's a little bit cloudy, but for the most part, it's been hot. Um, and so, but I feel like, you know, it, it's the Toronto way to complain about the heat, and then when winter comes, we complain in two, so. <laughs> right? You know, I don't get like, you know, I'm over, you're over here at Edmonton, it's about 21, 22 degrees, and people are saying, you know, oh, bring on the snow. I'm like, snow? Mm-mm, no. And I can stay away from no, that. No, what the hell are y'all calling for snow for? No, like, I, it's funny, like, I'm a born and raised Albertan, but I cannot stand snow, and I love hockey, and people don't get that about me. <laughs> Right, but like we agree, you can love hockey, but you don't have to like snow. Exactly, no. So like, put me in the middle of we know when we're out of a pandemic. Put me in the middle of L.A. or Miami or Vegas in December. I'm good. I am fine with that. <laughs> I'm good. Oh, uh, so kills. I gotta ask you. You know, being being a sports center anchor and being in sports general for both of us. Like, what was the thought process going back to? Let's go back to March in which. We saw the Rudy Gobert situation, and we saw the idea of, okay, maybe sports will go away for a month or a month and a half. We're sitting here in the middle of July, and we still don't have sports back fully yet. We're going we're to get them back within the next few weeks. So but what's it been like being a TSN anchor and really having no live sports to cover for going on four months? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been interesting, never to say the <laughs> least. But it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to be like, yeah, I'm a sports anchor with no damn sports to talk about. <laughs> um, but you know what? It's been, it's been never-ending when it comes to news stories mm-hmm. around sports, which is very interesting. Um, you know, obviously, as things develop, as leagues uh, look for their restart, they're still so much to talk about yes um and there's still so much news that's continuously um breaking you know you look at the nba you look at the nhl trying to come back mls is back yes we should call it the mls is back term it's the mls is day to day but it's all been interesting nonetheless um and so you know the content hasn't really shortened down on me no, I can imagine. I know you mentioned that you mentioned the MLS is back. You mentioned all these different tournaments, and you know, looking at all these leagues, how they've had you know the bubble circuit. Like, what are your thoughts on that? The idea of these leagues doing bubble? Because I mean, when I first heard baseball going to try it, I thought, well, okay, that didn't that didn't happen. And now you got MLS doing it. The NHL is going to do it, and the NBA is going to do it. And just my thing is that you know what, it is. You know, good on you for guys for attempting to do this, though, but it's still a pandemic, and it's still, like, well, maybe we'll be okay for one day, and then you'll see someone like Nashville SC has eight players with corona. It's really tough to really cover that when you, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a day-to-day thing, really, for this whole tournament, and any league that tries to play their games in one city for the time being. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to see um, just how this bubble situation has come together. Let's be very clear. <laughs> You know, as much as we want sports back, Mm -hmm. we should also acknowledge that sports makes a lot of money. And that is why we're here with the bubble situation. So here's the thing. You're asking athletes to put their lives literally on the line to give fans entertainment for leagues to make money. Absolutely. You know, so I'm not shocked that leagues have found a way to come back because guess what? The cash money is very appetizing. It is. Um, You know. 
But, yeah, sure, players want to get back to the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these are competitive beings who who love the game. That's their bread and butter. That's how they take care of their families. It's their livelihood. But I think it's also interesting that we're doing this in the middle of a pandemic where we still have a lot of not answered questions when it comes to COVID-19. There is no vaccine. Um, and so, really, this is just one big trial. Um, and it's best that teams, we only can plan for one, two weeks ahead as opposed to months ahead because you just never know what's going to happen. And, you know, I think leagues are also expecting players to test positive for COVID-19. The big question here is how many positive tests will it take to shut down play again? Exactly. That is a really big question. We don't know if it'll be, yeah, um, in other leagues, Five, six, seven, eight, and you know we were talking. We talk about these leagues. What about the NBA getting back and Major League Soccer and baseball, et cetera, et cetera? But a league that did come back first in this continent, and, and to an extent, in certain circles, been kind of forgotten, has been the NWSL. And I feel that they deserve more love for being the first to come back. Right, but isn't that? But doesn't that let you tell? Doesn't that tell you anything? Women run the world. Okay, <laughs> yes. we're out here doing it and doing it first, and always doing it right. I mean, look at the WNBA. They're about to restart their season, what, a week ahead of the NBA? Mm-hmm. Look at the WNBA and who really um, was having the conversations around social injustice in ways that leagues can really use that platform to really inject change. The WNBA did that. So when you look at the women's leagues and them really being at the forefront of all this, I hope years from now we look back and really sh- and really talk about that conversation and how women led during this time. Um, and so am I shocked that the women, women were out here doing it first? Absolutely not, because that is what we do. Amen. Couldn't agree with you more than that, Kayla. And you know, for yourself, being the first black woman to be an anchor on SportsCenter, and your your journey is just so incredible. So what has it been like, Dre, Dre, going from someone who worked in Winnipeg? Working in Prince Rupert. To now being here on TSN and being a true trailblazer for the sports industry in this country. Yeah, it's been, it's been a wild journey for me. Um, you know, I always knew that I wanted to get into sports. I didn't know what capacity, uh-huh. but, you know, just kind of, betting on myself to take Fred Van Vliet's words. Um, You know, just a little girl from Scarborough moved out to Winnipeg, her first job out of school, and then moving to Prince Rupert, British Columbia, then making her way back to Scarborough. Um, (laughs) It's been a journey. It's been a ride. Um, I've had some really cool moments along the way, obviously covering the Raptors championship, um, the parade, uh, just all of that stuff. it's, It's one of those things. And so, when we talk about that as my career, it's been amazing. But to do it as the first black woman in Canada, I think, you know, I, I'm very blessed and fortunate. Um, but for me, I can't be satisfied with being the first and only. Mm-hmm. My work is how do I make sure I'm not the only and make sure I'm not the last. So, you know, I've always been told through my mentors and through black women who have come before me and have really set the table and the tone to look back in the doors that I opened to make sure more black women and more black men are coming through the door. So hopefully that is what my legacy is, is how do I make sure that I have lasting change. Of course, you know, watching your work on TSN, Kayla, one thing I love about you is that you've never hidden your blackness. You've never said, you know, tried to repress anything about that. You've been out in the open. Nope, said, I'm I am a black. 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 Yeah, yeah, right. like, <laughs> I love that. But I love that. And seeing how you handle the haters on Twitter or social media, you have not apologized for one second, nor should you ever. I love that because some people might say, hey, you know, hey, tone that down. But you have not for one second toned <laughs> any of that down in any platform. I love that about you. Yeah, I don't feel... Listen, I got here on my own, too, and with the support of friends and family, but I got here, and I feel like I have found my success by just being myself. So I'm not here to apologize for that, for being who I am. And to be clear, I know I'm not for everybody. Nobody is for everybody. But who I'm for and my community, the black community, is who I'm I hope I represent well. I hope that I put on for, and I hope that I am doing proud. And to be honest, anyone outside of that community, their opinion, it don't really hold that much weight. Um, 
And, you know, I just think the biggest thing for black people that I want them to see, for those aspiring to be journalists, to be in media, is to just show up as you, to be enough, to know that you are enough. The way that you speak, the way that you talk, how you present, how you create is more than enough and it's and it's something that is so needed i mean you're around sports you know what it's like in canada it's the same thing um and so we need we need diverse voices we need diverse lenses we need diverse stories um and so you know the best thing i think that i've learned is to show up who i am as i am and not apologize for it because at the end of the day i gotta go to bed with my damn self Nobody else. So, so if I'm out here being fraudulent, I don't think I get as much sleep as at night. Fair enough at that point. That is very true. And you know, looking at what you've been doing on TSN, what I loved was that you had a piece where you at, on TSN. It's something that growing up, I never thought as a kid I would see a black anchor ta- asking the questions where can we be black? Like, to see you do that, and that piece was so powerful and just, it goes to show your impact and the impact of athletes who are not afraid to speak their voice. It goes to show other reporters in this country who are black, who are speaking out, and not hiding that they are black people. I love that you went out there and did it, because that was probably one of the best pieces I've ever seen on TSN. It's, you know, it's something where I've always, you know, made a promise that if I had a platform, or I had a platform, um, I would use it and I wouldn't, I wouldn't muzzle it. I wouldn't flip it or twist it. I mean, if you know me, you follow me, you're a friend of mine or, or a fan of mine, you know that I don't mince my words. I said what I said. Um, and so I keep that same energy when it comes to creating. Um, and I just feel strongly because, you know, I have a son and, I'm working towards building a, a, a place where he is accepted and valued and loved and protected for just being who he is. Um, and so absolutely, while I have the chance, the opportunity, and the window to speak my mind and tell stories the way that I want to, I'm going to do that. That is, that is excellent. You know, same age, we're both 27. We're both in media, considered young in the world media world. But what would it mean to you? Say, you know, in be it three to four years, you've got an influx of black women and young black boys who are out there saying, I want to get into sports because I saw Kayla Gray or because, you know, I saw Jermaine Franklin or I saw David Sanchez, whatever. What would it mean to be on that level where you can be up on that uh, crop of anchors and TSA reporters that gets that next wave in here? Because, you know, I think I personally have seen that there are black people who are our age who do want to get in, in history. But they have not seen those faces yet. So what do you mean by that face, right. you know, in, yeah, in the five years? It would be a dream, um, you know. And I think the real dream is them saying, I want to be better than that Kayla Gray. My goodness, five <laughs> years is fast, it's time for her to go, and I'm ready to come in. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, I, you know, this is what it's all about. It's, this is why I got into this industry, because I love to tell stories. And I know I'm not the only one that likes to tell stories. Mm-hmm. I've just been fortunate enough to be given an opportunity to do so in my skin with my boys. And more people need to be given that platform as well. Um, and so, you know, it goes back to pipeline. How are young black people feeling empowered yes. um, to feel like they can work in spaces where they can share their stories and tell their stories in their own way? Um, and so for me, that's the dream because we're doing something right. Um, we're empowering audiences that look like us to also want to be in rooms with us, but also be in other rooms that we're not in, and and not just for television, because it doesn't just stop at television. We need to talk about producers, directors, executives, presidents. That's the dream, uh, because we are so capable as black people. Um, And so, you know, the dream for me is a total shift in the landscape. Um, and how it looks. Of course, and I, I agree with it because we look at the, we look at different stations, networks, et cetera, et cetera, and I look at the board of directors, I look at who is hiring, and I have yet to see a prominent black face that's hiring talent, be it in a small town, be it in a larger network, and we're lacking that. You, you, you do see it more in America, but in Canada, we are severely lacking, and if we're going to be able to get the next on-air talent who is black, who's here talking about 
black stories who's here talking about hockey or baseball or football and they're not getting hired because of how they look then we're not going to get any change at all we're going to be running in circles for the next 25 years yeah yeah and that's but this is what i'm saying is you know a lot of people are like oh we need more people on air and yes we do need more people on air we need more black people on mm -hmm. air um, but we also need more black people in the boardrooms. We yes. need more black people that have buying power when it comes to properties. We need more black people when it comes to hiring power, when it comes to bringing people into spaces and empowering employees of color to make changes, to tell compelling stories. So truly, it goes from the top down, in my opinion. Of course it does. I know you mentioned earlier, you mentioned um, you were... Mitch, you were covering the Raptors parade. I was there too, doing a feature for a site in Australia called the Aurora Sports. And that parade, I got into town, Kayla. I was walking my suitcase. Wa I walked past City Hall at seven in the morning, and it was almost already full at seven a.m. And I, my mind was blown. So, just what was that like for you to be on TSN and on air, realizing that we were all in one area to watch a Toronto Raptors? championship parade it was like being a part of the coverage to be a part of something that was true sports history in this country yeah it's one of those things where it was incredible um you know i'm from scarborough so to kind of see people that i knew people that i grew up with uh in the crowd that was crazy and wild for me um and i felt like it was just such a special moment for the city of Toronto that just goes so hard for the Raptors, um, Jurassic Park. It just it was it felt like such a fun party. Like I can tell you, we planned for a three hour broadcast, and that joint lasted eight hours. Yep. <laughs> Uh, just to let you know how many people were down there. Um, and so it was such an incredible experience, and I'm so grateful for it. It's one I think that I'll never forget. And, you know, I'm looking at, I've been looking at photos about it. Um, and, and I can't wait to get those, those photos I took printed because it was truly an amazing moment. It was. You know what? Looking back on just Raptors history, all those years of this team um, finishing last in the division, the years of of guys like, you know, Rafael LaRugio and Andrea Bagnani and 25 wins. It felt surreal, to be honest. It didn't feel real, Kayla. It really didn't. Well, because as you mentioned, we've had some years. There has been some years of the stress and the disappointment. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where I think everything kind of worked out the way that it did. Um, and, hey, who's complaining about a chip, right? Right. Now, that is true. That, no, no one's complaining now. And now you know the Raptors are in the bubble. Now, you know, people have always been... This is a season where people are talking about, oh, you know, what's, what are the Bucks going to do? What are the Sixers going to do? What are the Lakers going to do? It's a good thing to you that they're being overlooked. The other people out there are talking more about the Bucks and Sixers. But I'm hearing very little, at least down south, what the Raptors are going to do. Yeah, well, never mind what the, what the Bucks and the everyone out south is going to do how about what COVID-19 is going to do let's right. be very real we're still in a, in, you know, yes. a, pa a co coronavirus pandemic mm -hmm. um, and so for some people it's even, for me to be honest that's my biggest that's the biggest concern that I have as a sports fan but also someone that covers the league too when it comes to the Raptors it's the same old you know what it is yep. um, you know it's American media obviously catering to American uh, fan base and that's why the Raptors are never in these conversations. Should they be in these conversations? Absolutely they should. And let's be very clear, American media knows that they should be too. But sometimes you got to give the people what they want. When you talk to the Raptors, though, you know, they don't, they do not really care about mm -hmm. what people are or are not saying about them. Um, and in fact, they rather fly under the radar just like they did last season. Um, because, you know, when you talk to coach and when you talk to players, like they're fine with just keeping that in house and keeping their conversations in house. They're not proof, they're not out there to prove anything to anybody, just themselves and they know what they're capable of. So, and if you talk about them, but it's also if you don't, that's cool too. Of course not. 
that's true. You know, I know you've been around this team for a while. Like, looking at you know when when we've been in non-pandemic times, like this looks like the most fun team in the NBA. Watching the interactions of um, guys like Kyle Lowry and Nick Nurse, watching the drip fest between Serge and OG. Like I would love to be down there talking to these guys because Raptors have looked like they're. They're having them by far the most fun of any team in the league this year, Kayla. Yeah, um, I definitely think that they have a lot of fun. But, you know, um, I think they're just a group of guys that just like to be around each other. (laughs) And I mean that genuinely. Um, But I think more importantly, they're just a group of, of players that are incredibly talented but also work incredibly hard. Um, so while it is fun, um, I think the one thing that stands out to me the most is the work ethic there and how much everyone's on the same page when it comes to the vision and the end goal. Um, and that has never gotten lost at all this season. It's just almost an added bonus of how how fun these guys are seeming to have with each other. Of course, of course. And Kayla, I got to ask you know, my last question for you now. Being being from Toronto, being Scarborough, being in the Toronto area, I got to ask you. I, I have my opinion, but for someone who may be coming into the city, where is the best place in Toronto to get rice and peas or roti in your mind? Oh my God, my mom's house? But y'all ain't allowed to come there. Can I come over sometime? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Listen, I'm I'm, I'm I'm a Jamaican, so that's where I go. I, that's where I've always gone nah, for you... my rice and peas, and ackee and saltfish, and roti, and, and curry goat, and all those things. Um, I mean, there's there's the island foods, Ritz. Uh, you know, we have a jerk house near me right now. But to be honest, the only place I go for my food is my mama's food because if you Jamaican, you know you're not eating oxtail from nobody else but your mama. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Kayla, I appreciate you doing the podcast. Got to do it again sometime. I had a blast talking to you today, Kayla. I appreciate you. Thank you so much.